Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth. On Now You Know. We're sponsored by EcoWare.us, where you can find new designs every week, and we carbon offset the production, shipping, and life cycle of every product, and we plant a tree for every order, in addition to capping a well, and you now get free shipping. And we're brought to you by abetterrootplanner.com, our favorite EV trip planner with waypoints. Use our link in the show notes below to get a 30-day free trial to the A Better Root Planner premium app. Plan your next EV trip with abetterrootplanner.com. And we're sponsored by bigbattery.com with the best battery prices in the USA, guaranteed. If you've got something you need to power from homes to cars, RVs to boats, and much more, BigBattery.com has you covered, offering the newest battery tech. Use the code now you know to save 5% off your purchase today at BigBattery.com. All right, so this decade, the one we're in right now, is going to be an amazing time of technological disruption. We're going to discuss five things in this episode that are going to touch all of our lives in this decade. Now, you might be wondering, uh, hey guys, this is 2021. Why didn't you make this episode last year in 2020? And the answer is, it's easy to overpredict future fantasies. We've been told for decades that we'll be getting jetpacks and flying cars soon. And while these things do exist, for most of us, these are just fantasies. Yeah, fun ones, but fantasies nonetheless, built upon wishes and hopes. But the five things that we're going to discuss in today's episode, let's just say that we waited until the tech curves and the price curves looked right. And now they look right to us. So we believe these technologies are ripe. Their time has come and they will be picked this decade. So let's get to it. In no particular order, the first tech that's going to affect all of our lives this decade is human space travel. And of course, we're talking about the amazing innovation of SpaceX's reusable rockets and the ability to refuel in orbit. Since Falcon 9's first launch in 2010, SpaceX has become the leader in rocket technology. I mean, just look at these charts. Like, launch outcomes. And take a look, since 2017, 100% successful launches. Or this chart, showing how many successful Falcon 9 booster landings there have been. And let's just cut to the chase. Making rocket boosters reusable means flights get cheaper. The Falcon 9 was able to launch cargo and satellites way less than their competitors right out of the gate. And now it can even launch astronauts into space cheaper than anyone else. It cost $62 million to launch a reused Falcon 9 versus $110 million to launch an Atlas V, which is a comparable rocket. And Starship will be even more cost-effective. So what does this all mean for you? It means three things will be happening in this decade, two of which I think are going to blow your mind. The first is that we're going back to the moon. And I know, this doesn't blow your mind because we already did it back in the 60s. But now we're not just gonna go up there and hop around and hit some golf balls. We're gonna be building a moon base. And I think that this is something that most people haven't really allowed themselves to imagine very much. What does it mean to have a moon base? I think for most people, we kind of imagine people in uniforms, you know, kind of walking around because that's all we've really seen from space shows is, you know, well, they're astronauts and, and those people are professionals and they're the best of the best. And so, you know, it's not going to be me up there. But what if it were? Yeah, I mean, there's going to be moon tourism. You're not going to have to be an astronaut to go to the moon. Now, you may not know this, but space tourism exists today. Um, there have been people who have paid a lot of money uh, to get to go into space on a rocket ship. And you might be saying, well, why haven't I heard of it? Well, it's because they paid millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And no one that you know probably uh, got to do this. But as the price of space flight comes down, more and more people are going to be able to afford tourism, and it's gonna be able to pay for a lot of other space activities. Like what? So just to start out with, um, moon sports. I mean, you think that basketball here on Earth is cool. What if you can jump 10 times as high? Isn't that exciting? You could put the yeah. net super high up. Jump, you know, athletes can be competing. Because, I mean, I think if we're going to be able to send Tom Cruise to space to do a movie, that in the future, why not, you know, send LeBron James or someone like that to play basketball? All right. That sounds cool. And, you know, maybe moon sports isn't your thing. But I think the thing that almost anyone can get behind would be space cuisine. Wait, what? Space cooking. I'm saying if you're on the moon yeah. and there's less gravity or if you're in zero G in space and there's no gravity. Oh, so my souffles will be much bigger. Yeah, there's no, <laughs> if they pop, it's no big deal. And you're just thinking souffles. You're not thinking of all the multitudes of things that you could cook and eat in zero gravity or low gravity that you just couldn't do today. For the longest time, space food has been kind of the least exciting kind of food in the world, unless you're at a gift shop, in which case it seems really interesting. You're like, oh, 
ice cream sandwich for an astronaut. This just gave me an idea for a pizza restaurant I could open up on the moon where the pizza cooks will be throwing up the dough hundreds of feet and then catching it. It'll be so much fun to watch. That's what exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, we have whole TV networks dedicated to just Here's food. I'm imagining Guy Fieri is going to have his own show where he's going to different moon bases and, and colonies and stuff like that. Um, Bam! Yeah, yeah, exactly. Again, we haven't even started to think about it. And yet food, one of the most interesting and and captivating things for everyone since everybody eats has been largely ignored as soon as launching food into orbit doesn't become like, well, we need to save every single, you know, gram. And it turns into I have a space restaurant and I need to, uh, you know, sell a three thousand dollar meal uh in orbit what do i gotta do to get that to happen and i want to talk about moon tourism again uh, i think that we think of it as just rich people going to space but as soon as it gets to the price where the masses can go to the moon and have a vacation then travel becomes kind of like what it is here on earth it opens up a new perspective for the way you see your life i mean i remember the first time i traveled to a new country and i was just like wait this is how they cook this is how they do things it's different than my country why are they doing it this way? Could we do it this way back home? And it just opens your mind to these new possibilities. So as people go to the moon and they look down on Earth and they're like, whoa, this is blowing my mind. This is a new way to think about my life. Basically, every single astronaut that has gone to space has come back with this sort of perspective, this more global perspective, because they've been flying over the entire Earth. Every country, uh, they've seen it as an actual you know, ball in space. And especially when you go to the moon and, and the earth is, you know, pretty small in the sky and you're like, oh, that's that's everybody that I've ever met right there mm -hmm. on that thing. It does change people's perspectives. And I think that we've kind of gotten a little used to earth rise. We've kind of gotten a little used to, uh, you know, the pale blue dot and pictures from, well, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, the pale blue dot, unless you know and understand what's happening, it uh, doesn't make much sense. It's true. I mean, you can go on the internet right now and find a picture of just about anything. That's not the same as when you go to that place. And as soon as you go to Spain or you go to Africa, you have an experience that you couldn't possibly have gotten from a photograph. And this is just one of the things that is going to happen when we have uh, moon tourism. Now, the next thing that cheap reusable rockets will enable us to do, along with the amazing innovation of Starship happening before our eyes, is we will be landing humans on Mars in this decade. And that blows my mind because Mars is so much further away than the moon. And it's not like taking a three day journey. It, it's going to be a six to eight month, uh, you know, space trip to get humans uh, to Mars. That is going to really change the way that we think as well. And I mean, once you get to Mars, you then have to figure out how to make rocket fuel on Mars to refuel the rocket to then relaunch it back to Earth. That's mind blowing. Throughout human history, we've always had the frontier. We've always had this place that you could go where everything was new and everything was being, you know, built and it was the first time anything was happening there. And we've lost that in in the recent decades where yeah. we've been to basically every corner of the earth. We're sending, you know, submarines down to the bottoms of the ocean. Rich people get Sherpas to carry them up uh, Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. Every nook and cranny of the earth, not we, I'm not saying without exception, but for the most part has been traveled. It's been lost in our imagination. We used to dream of the frontier and now most of us are just like, I'm happy to sit on the couch. Right. And I think that's what the moon and Mars are gonna bring back. It's going to be this constant exploration, if not by you, by others. And that's humankind, right? Traveling to these places. It's gonna renew the imagination and the spirit of what we, I think as humans are good at, which is pushing our boundaries. Exactly, that spirit of exploration um, should never be lost. And the third thing that SpaceX's technology is going to unlock in this decade is intercontinental rocket travel. Boring. We just talked about going to the moon and Mars. Now you're talking about what, going to the other side of the earth? I'm talking about traveling across the world in a rocket in minutes. You'll be able to fly on a rocket from New York to Shanghai in 39 minutes. According to Elon, all of this will be for the price of an existing airline ticket. And that's pretty amazing because sometimes you can't go from New York to New Jersey in 39 minutes. Exactly. And 
I think a lot of people are thinking, well, again, this is going to be just rich people. Or it's not going to affect me. No, this is going to become commonplace. This sounds crazy, just as crazy as it did at Kitty Hawk to have imagined that someday people will be using these crazy airplanes to fly around the world. And right. you would have been like, no, not going to happen. You can barely get this thing to take off. Right. It's just you on there, Orville. What you think you think that there's going to be planes full of what? Hundreds of people? No way. So this will become commonplace in this decade. And I just want to point out how it's going to affect us, because I know you're also saying, well, you can take a plane right now to Shanghai. A plane from New York to Shanghai right now takes about a day. And I've never taken that plane. I've wanted to go to Asia. I have lots of friends in Asia, but I've never been able to bring myself to go. You know what? I can't go for 24 hours of flight unless I'm going to have like at least three weeks of of trip there. And in my busy schedule, I've never been able to make that happen. There's lots of places like Australia and Hawaii that I'd love to go, but the flight time itself is just one of the big overwhelming factors. In fact, I don't think I've ever flown for more than eight hours straight. Yeah, I think the furthest we've ever flown was to Europe, and that was it. And I think for many of us, that is the limiting factor. We're just not willing to spend that much time traveling. But I'll tell you one thing. If I could be in Shanghai in 39 minutes, I'd be having lunch there today. And you could be home for dinner. That's absolutely insane. It's going to change so many lives because I would be able to run a business there. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And again, I hear what you're saying. Well, what if it's not me? What if I don't want to get on a rocket? I won't get on a rocket and I won't go to Mars and I won't go to Shanghai in 39 minutes. But even if you don't personally fly to the moon or Mars or Shanghai on a rocket in this next decade, it will change your world because other people will be traveling on them. But let's talk about some more down to earth technologies that will also be transpiring in this next decade. This is gonna be the decade of robo taxis. And just to be clear, a robo taxi is a self-driving car with no driver in the car that you can hail on your phone, that the car will arrive, you will open the door, you will get in, it will drive you to your destination with nobody in it. You get out of the car, you close the door, it drives away to go pick up somebody that else. That sounds so expensive. Well, no, nope, it's going to be cheaper than an Uber today because you don't have to pay for the driver. Yeah, that's the thing that people probably haven't really wrapped their heads around yet because it seems impossible that a car is going to drive itself, let's be honest. But that's going to happen in this decade. And when it does, it's going to disrupt a lot of things. Let's talk about jobs. There are over 200,000 taxi drivers in the United States. There's 1.5 million Uber drivers. There's 3.5 million truck drivers. And there's about a million gig or delivery drivers. Oh, and don't forget bus drivers. There's about 680,000 of those. And there's even more jobs where people need to drive for their living. And that accounts for over 7 million jobs. Just in the US. That could be disrupted by robo taxis. Now, I know that that's hard to imagine because 7 million jobs, what is that equivalent to? That is equivalent to every retail worker and cashier out of a job. Those are the two most common jobs in the United States. Wait, so you're saying if I walk into any place of business today and there's no cashier or retail worker, all those jobs are gonna be gone. The equivalent of that number of jobs will be gone when robo-taxis finally take over. That is what it would look like. And I'm not saying that it's gonna happen overnight and I'm not saying that it's going to take 30 years. It's going to happen slowly. There will definitely be little bastions where you're like, well, well you need a driver for that particular case. But eventually, I think that around 7 million jobs just in the United States could easily be disrupted by full self-driving, robo-taxis, robo-trucks, robo-buses. And we can talk about jobs all day long. I mean, who's going to lose them? What new jobs will be created? But another huge effect of robo-taxis will be on all of our daily lives. As we've already demonstrated in our 10-part Autonomous Driving Future series, we are going to get a lot of huge benefits once robo-taxis become a reality in this decade. Yeah, less traffic, for instance. And a lot of people don't believe it, but it's true. Once robo taxis hit, there won't be many cars on the road. There'll be a fraction of them, which means that parking spaces will disappear and they'll be replaced by much nicer things than all of these stretches of concrete and asphalt. And overall, we'll be saving a ton on transportation. And we'll have way less death and accidents. Hundreds of thousands, yes, I said hundreds of thousands of us will stay alive every year instead of dying in automobile accidents. And because these robo taxis will be EVs, our air will be cleaner and everything will be quieter. Just breathe that in for a second. 
And I know it's hard to imagine this, so let's go back to like the 1890s when they were planning out cities. And every time you'd plan out a new city block, you'd have to plan in a few things to do with horses. For instance, you'd have to have space for horses to be tied up out in front of uh, businesses. And you'd have to plan for a place to put all the horse poop that was going to accumulate as more and more people took their horses to your business. And so at the turn of the century, when the car began to dominate. What did it look like to be a city planner at that time? You'd go, oh, thank goodness. We don't have to have the, you know, the horse manure station depot. We don't need the stables. We don't need all the hay to feed the horses. Oh, this is great. We just need thousands and thousands and thousands of parking spaces because everyone's going to be driving their, their shiny new car. And uh, we're going to need, you know, gas pumps and service stations and uh, everything like that. So I guess we're going to have to have this entire city block taken up by a parking lot and uh, the basement of this entire building adding millions of dollars of cost to the construction of this building. But at least we don't have to look after all those horses. Right. And we don't think of our own limits as limits anymore. They only become apparent as the new technology takes over. So, for instance, when you switch from horses to cars, you then realize once the cars take over that you don't have to deal with that poop and smell anymore. But it wasn't apparent really while it was a thing because you're like, well, of course, this is a thing. These are horses. And it's only been recently that we've started to look into the harm that's being done by having gas burning cars drive around. It's only been recently that we've been actually attributing deaths to the pollution that they cause. And so by switching to EV robo taxis, we can put an end to that as well. All right. So the fifth technology we're going to talk about here is personal humanoid robots. In this decade coming up, we're going to get autonomous humanoid robots. So in the 80s, when I first saw this robot here, the Honda Robot P-Series, I think it caught a lot of people's imagination to see this thing walking around, looks like a human, but it's not. Um, and then in 2000, Honda came out with an even better version, Asimo, which could do even more things. But what was impeding the development of these humanoid robots was some very needed technology. Yeah, number one, you need batteries, right? So keep in mind that in the 80s, we didn't have lithium ion batteries, we probably would have had to have used like lead acid. Um, and then in the 2000s, when lithium ion batteries did come along, they were super expensive. Boston Dynamics' spot battery, for example, today costs $4,600. Back in the year 2000 or 2005, it probably would have cost $46,000 because the price of batteries have dropped by that much. The second limiting factor in personal humanoid robots is computer processing. Computers in the 80s, look like this. They're very limited in terms of RAM, CPU speed, etc. It's only been recently that computers have been fast enough, small enough, energy efficient enough, cheap enough to allow for the third tech needed, autonomy. You need a way for the robot to see where it is in the world and interact with its environment. Now, most of these early robots were actually just controlled by some humans behind a screen, moving it around with joysticks. If you want robots to actually be able to do this, then you need an incredible amount of computer processing power, vision, and other sensors all working in real time for the robot to know what to do. Now, you might be saying, these robots are just dancing following a pre-recorded movement. They aren't actually reacting to their environment. But they can. Here's the key to why this tech is now not only possible, but inevitable. The convergence of low enough prices and capabilities for batteries, computers, and autonomy makes it so that this is going to happen now. This is why both autonomous robo-taxis and autonomous humanoid robots will both be making their debut in this decade. And by debut, we don't mean a little demo at a convention. We mean widespread adoption across the planet. Now, the implications of robo-taxis and humanoid autonomous robots 
is going to be profound. It's going to change so many things about life as we know it today and send us off into new directions of innovation and technology and society that we can't even fathom. But here's the thing about humans. When we progress into a new technological era, we quickly take it for granted. You have a little computer in your pocket that you take for granted, something that you wouldn't have even been able to comprehend a little over a decade ago. All right, so let's say you were a farmer living pretty much anywhere on earth back in say 1832. And one day while you're tending your field, you came upon a big rock in the field. And so you got some rope and you wrapped it around the rock and you hooked it up to your mule and you pulled it out of your field. And then you realized it had been covering a hole. And when you bent down to investigate the hole, you got sucked into a time wormhole and you popped out in 2021. So now here you are in the future where your farm used to be is now a suburb. So you bump into Zach, who's checking out the latest over the air update in his Model 3. Uh, excuse me there, sir. I, I seem to have fallen through some type of time hole and I, I feel like I may be in the future. Uh, where am I and what, what year is this? Oh, hey, you're, you're in Massachusetts and it's the year 2021. Interesting. So I'm in the same place but I'm 189 years in the future. Cool. Well, are you hungry? Uh, do you want to get some lunch? Actually, I'm famished. I was moving a great big stone all morning. Well, great. Hop in and we'll go grab some lunch. Grab some, whoa, what tarnation. Why are we, why are we going so fast? Uh, this is what everyone does in 2021. We drive in automobiles uh, to fast food restaurants. I've never gone this fast in my life. Now what are you, now what are you doing? Uh, I'm just grabbing some food from the drive-thru window. Here you go. Lunch is free in the future. How do they know what you wanted? How, does everyone eat the same food in the future? Uh, no, no. So I, I ordered it on my smartphone and uh, before we left, and uh, I ordered some for you. I hope you like avocado toast. Uh, avocado? Avocados are grown thousands of miles away. Uh, how, how much did this cost? How much do I owe you, sir? Uh, it's only a few bucks. Uh, avocados and all the food is shipped thousands of miles every day all around the world by trucks or airplanes. Air? Planes? Yeah, like like that one right up there. There's a jet now. I mean, they can fly people and cargo all around the world, hundreds of miles an hour. And you've flown in one of those? Oh yeah, I mean, everyone does. So we just went back a few generations and yet everything is unrecognizable from the technology to the customs to the food you eat. It's all completely different. Today's future is completely unimaginable to that farmer. You couldn't even have a conversation with that farmer about what life is like today because even something as simple as going for lunch doesn't make any sense to that farmer. Why would you hop in a car and go faster than he's ever gone in his life? It just doesn't seem to make any sense. And that's why it's so difficult to talk about what's coming next. It's exactly like if that farmer jumped back out of the wormhole, ran back into his farmhouse and went, honey, honey, wouldn't believe it. I went in a thing and there was a car and we drove, we must have been driving about 70 miles an hour. That's not possible, <laughs> Herbert. And it's true, it's true. And they had aeroplanes and they could fly hundreds of miles an hour up in the sky. Have you I, been drinking again? And I had an avocado for the first time what? in my whole life. And apparently it only cost a few dollars, which did seem expensive. But I'm guessing that the dollar wasn't worth quite as much as it is, was today. Honey, I don't <laughs> know what you've been drinking. And that's why when we're talking about stuff today, it's like people are just like, what are you crazy? It's never going to, we're never going to go to Mars. There's never going to be a robot in my house that walks around and does chores for me. That's stuff of the 1950s where they thought we were going to have all this neat stuff, but it was just a guy in a cardboard suit. But yeah, these five things are just the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be way more things, way more disruption like Neuralink, Hyperloop boring tunnels, medicines we can't imagine. And these technologies are all gonna shock the system. We haven't seen technological disruption hit this fast before in human history. As humans, we're used to a pretty glacial speed in terms of technological advancement. Here's a paper if you want it, Dad. Good. I was wondering where that doggone kid was. Where's Mom, Jeannie? Starting supper. I'm going to help her as soon as I finish this algebra problem.
Oh, did he? You know what it says here? They're going to take out all our phones and put in them kind with dials on them. Oh, Gramps, that's yummy. Does it say how soon? A few weeks, I guess. That'll be just super. Oh, sure. What did you say, Gramps? I said, oh, sure. As soon as a man gets used to one thing, by golly, somebody wants to take it away from him. Good Gramps. We've had that old phone since... Well, I bet since Daddy was a boy. We ought to be glad to have modern telephones. Oh, shucks. You young'uns are never satisfied these days. Uh, Folks are getting more worried about being modern than they are over the three square meals. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we'd like to think that nothing will change. And in fact, we plan our lives according to it. We kind of lock in our plans for the future based on a certain time of our lives. Whatever tech is available when you're either coming of age or maybe settling down, it kind of gets locked in. You kind of think that that's the way it's always going to be. And that's how you perceive your future will continue to be. I mean, and this worked pretty well up until fairly recently because new tech evolved so slowly that you weren't really affected. I mean, by the time computers edged out typewriters, you were probably retired. For instance, Bill Clinton becomes president in 1992, right? And during his presidency, guess how many emails he sent? Uh, 23,000. Two. But he's the president of the United States yeah, of America. But, but remember, when he got elected in 1992, there was no email, and it only started happening at the end of his presidency. And so I just want to give another example. Let's pretend that you uh, were a journalist. You were born in 1950. You graduated college in the 70s. Um, you got your first job at a newspaper, and uh, the main way you wrote up your stories would be? Quill and ink? I don't know. I'm it's the 70s. Disco? Typewriters. <laughs> okay, okay. I don't, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. Okay, so... You're a journalist, you type up most of your stories on a typewriter, you hand them to your editor on paper, right? That's your job. That works really well for you, but now along comes the computer. What do you do as a journalist? Well, I mean, the typewriter kind of evolves slowly into the word processor where you can kind of do like a backspace and you're like, oh, thank goodness I don't have to white out the thing when I send it to my editor. But then, you know, the computer comes along and it's a little bit more complicated, but luckily you're about to retire. Right. I mean, you probably retired before you had to get really involved with the Internet and all that kind of stuff. You pretty much dodged that bullet. You could just stick with the technology you knew, which is largely the typewriter or the early word processor for your whole career. And then you retired happily. And that was it. And I think that that was the last generation that is ever going to be able to do that. I think exactly. because I have gone from being told in second grade that I was going to need to learn cursive and I was gonna be writing everything in cursive and in pen, and then I went to typing with my fingers, and now I'm just down to my thumbs. I do most of my communication through these two digits for the first time in human history. And they didn't teach you that in school. Not, not even a little bit. I remember the home row, but I don't remember anything about using your thumbs or about T9 or about swiping or anything like that. And that journalist we just talked about was probably one of the last people who could get away with what we just mm -hmm. talked about, right? If you're born any later, let's take someone born in 1980. Mm -hmm. um, they graduate college around 2000. They get a job as a journalist, just like before. And now they're doing their job on, you know, computers. Mm -hmm. But along comes the smartphone and... Remember, a smartphone came around in 2010, so you as a journalist who started working in 2000 didn't have a smartphone. You might not even have had a cell phone. Right. Could you ignore that new technology? Could you be a journalist without a cell phone? Let's reenact that for you. Murphy, get in here. Uh, y yes, sir. What, what is taking you so long to write your, your stories? Oh, I just, I write them in my notebook and uh, and then I transcribe that and I uh, type <sighs> it up and- We don't have time for that, Murphy. You need to, why aren't you using like a smartphone or something like that to, to write your stories up? You know, I didn't grow up with a smartphone, so I just go down to the pay phone. No, 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 it, no, no pay phones, okay? Get, get yourself a cell phone at least so you can keep up with your sources, okay? Uh, it's just so hard to learn. I, Thank I, you, Murphy. That will be all. If you don't get a cell phone, you're probably going to be fired. Yeah, there's no getting around new technology that comes along today. Even your mother and your grandmother probably have smartphones. There's just no escaping it. And you have to help them get onto Zoom calls and stuff like that. There is absolutely no way that you can continue to live as if it were 1980. And this brings us to education. How we educate going forward has to change. Our educational system was last overhauled about 150 years ago when the Industrial Revolution was the big technological elephant in the room. I mean, everyone had to adapt to this new technology of factories. Before that, 
education was pretty short. You basically just had to get up and running on learning what you needed to run a farm. Pretty much everyone was a farmer. With factories, everything changed. We went from pretty much everyone being a farmer in the 1700s to pretty much nobody being a farmer by the end of the 1800s. And at the time, education changed in order to accommodate for that. They needed factory workers. So yeah. public education changed to make good factory workers. Yeah. Bells went off every hour to let you know to go to the next room to learn the next thing that would make you a good employee in the factory. And in fact, now now, if we fast forward to today, we've already shifted again, and yet our educational system is still lagging behind in the 1800s. And as time goes forward, we're going to continue to see a shift away from labor-intensive jobs like truck driver, taxi driver, you know, even retail sales, but also laborers, you know, think of roofers and stuff like that, all of which could mostly be done by robots. We need to have a population that is prepared so that this technological wave doesn't crush it, but instead we can ride it. Having a robotic laborer is not a bad thing, just in the same way having a combine harvester is not a bad thing. But to go back to our 1800s farmer, he never heard of a computer programmer or a battery scientist or a rocket engineer. These would have seemed like beyond science fiction. But now they're good paying jobs in fields that we recognize and respect. And we can't even imagine what the jobs of the future will look like, but we can start moving in the right direction. I know that it doesn't seem like education and these future things that we're talking about are in any way connected, but they are deeply extraordinarily rooted. And without leadership that understands what will happen, we won't be able to prepare for that future. Elon Musk is one type of leader in this regard. He's moved industries forward faster than anyone I can think of. And he's even said publicly that he's not looking for college degrees. He's looking for problem solvers. He's moving people from being kind of a mediocre, you know, specialized engineer to more of an interdisciplinary engineer that can tackle a wide array of problems all on their own. But he's not moving the rest of the population at the same speed. We need today's educational leaders to study Elon and understand what he's doing so that they can also innovate and prepare their students for the future. That 1800s farmer learned a bit of arithmetic and English and maybe a little bit of history, but effectively no science because well, he didn't need it. He could go through his whole life without needing to know any of that stuff. He got what he needed to survive, handed down from his parents, most likely. But that's only because technology moves so slowly that he could pick up new tech once in a decade. Oh, I heard that there was some kind of new plow out there. I think that I will go purchase that. There wasn't constant innovation that was going to disrupt him. But today's new teacher out of college isn't being taught how to teach their students about breakthroughs in nanotechnology, bioscience, materials, and energy. You may see a 3D printer at a school, but for the most part, that's tacked on. It's not a core part of the curriculum because unfortunately, most educators don't understand the technology or its future value. And this leads to a really important point. When choosing who will educate you or your children, you should really ask yourself, do they get it? If they don't get what's happening right now in the world around us, if they don't get the technological innovation, then they shouldn't be teaching you. Yeah, you should run away. Don't walk. Run away from institutions that don't really understand what the future is going to look like, what they're preparing you for. And I wish that I could be talking directly to educators and to people who are in charge of educators and say, we need to push this ball forward. We need to rewrite the curriculum to teach soft skills, skills that people can adapt and, and learn and how to learn and other stuff like that. It's not just good enough to be able to type or be able to just recite things. We need to have smart, intelligent people. And we also need to take the children who normally would fall through the cracks and you go, oh, poor Timmy. He just, not, not the brightest bulb. I think that that's a load of crap. I think that basically the cracks were kind of put into the system to say, oh, well, Timmy isn't that smart. And I guess he's going to drop out in the ninth grade. And uh, well, that's just too bad. I guess he'll be a garbage collector or something like that. But it's okay because we need garbage collectors. And that's a noble profession. I, and I think the cracks that you're talking about are created by the fact that our teachers of today, for the most part, their curriculum does not involve learning how to be an engineer. So therefore, they cannot teach kids how to be an engineer. And it's not just engineers. I don't think that teachers need to be just engineers. I think that we need to have a broader range of subjects, things that will excite, you know, the the 
kids who are just generally not good students. And, oh, I don't know why. Because here's the thing. There are amazing teachers that will kind of go outside of the curriculum in order to get more of their students involved. And I've seen kids who are, you know, the worst students. And, oh, boy, oh, Johnny, not that bright. And he doesn't have a bright future ahead of him. Light up when they are looking at the right subjects with the right teacher under the right guidance. But unfortunately, there's just no room in the educational system for those types of teachers and that kind of curriculum today because we don't put the kinds of resources into our educational system that we really need to start doing. And you might be saying, but we're going to be putting so much energy and resources into education. But you have to keep in mind what you're getting out at the other end. If we have robots and robo taxis that are able to do a lot of the more menial jobs that humans have been doing for centuries, it means that we can open up the possibilities of the future to be able to create more value per human which is something that we've continually done. Again, we moved from hunter-gatherers to farmers to factory workers. Now we need to decide the next step in human evolution, if you want to even look at it that way. And the biggest stumbling block will be education. And these five things that we're talking about are not the only tech coming. They're gonna be amazing disruptive tech coming in AI, medicine, Hyperloop, boring tunnels, Neuralink, and many more. And these are the kinds of questions you should be asking your educators about when you go to those back to school nights or when you go to those school committee meetings. And if you get blank stares, I don't think those are the people that should be leading your children forward in education. These five things that we've been talking about that are coming in this decade are just the tip of a giant wave of technological disruption that is coming. You may look out at the horizon and say, that's just a tiny wave out there, but it's gonna be huge. And it's unfortunately gonna wash over a lot of people as all tech has done in the past for those who weren't prepared. So we want you to start imagining, start preparing, get your wetsuit on, grab your board, start paddling out and get ready to ride this wave because it's going to be an amazing ride. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Now you know.